Why am I doing this talk? The candid motivation is I want you as developers to do more of the work that you assign to auditors yourselves. Um, we get a lot of questions, you know, someone signs up for an audit, the audit's gonna start in two months, the code will be frozen, and then we invariably get the question, can we help you prepare for the audit somehow? Can we help you get, like, make sure that the audit runs smoothly? Um, there's a few obvious ones. Let's see, do you have a pointer? I do. Uh, these things I'm not going to talk about because I hope dearly that if you hire an auditing company, you have good tests, they run, they pass, you have integration tests, you got documentation, and you make sure that your devs are available for the couple of weeks that you're going to spend on an audit if, in case a question comes up. Um, those are the basics. But I know a lot of teams are really, really highly skilled and they're very motivated and they want to do more if they can. So, uh, well, what can you do? What's What's the secret sauce to getting a good audit? Actually, what's the secret sauce of the auditors, auditors like us? Different audit companies do different things, but we have our own little method of working, which I'm gonna share with you. Um, invariants. We like something called invariants. Sometimes you call them properties or property-based tests or whatever your favorite, equations over state. Uh, I usually just use the word invariants for everything. Uh, they help you find more bugs, write better docs, uh, trust your code more. They help auditors, because you know, as auditors, especially we, we're gonna be looking at invariants and trying to find more of our, like invariants of our own, basically. So if you come with a little set of these that you've already gone over, you've done some of our work for us. Uh, and we can focus on like either deeper work or we can work more efficiently and get you done faster. Um, so we want you to come up with invariants of your on-chain code. Um, they're also good fuss targets. We're going to get to that. Uh, they also, one thing we found, especially developers, they can tell you exactly like, oh, you have to go to this function and this function you will see exactly uh, where this variable get updated and everything. And once you start talking about invariants and we say things like, well, just the sum of all balances always match the total balance and so on, then we find that a lot of auditors, or sorry, developers start looking at their code from a new angle, because this is sort of a top-down angle. It's almost like you're coming back to the design phase, uh, moving out of like the optimized imperative code uh, and thinking in a more declarative fashion. Um, don't have to read all this. I just like to have things. I know this is being recorded. I, I myself like to pause slightly talks and like read slides. Uh, so I put more on here than... Uh, I'm gonna read, so don't read all of it. I'm just gonna say really quickly, here's how we're gonna structure this talk. Uh, we're gonna go over like how to make invariants. I call that state is just equations. Uh, then how to prove invariants, at least uh, in a pen and paper fashion, which is what we often do. Uh, talk about how to approach things when you can't really get your proof to work. And also how to use your invariants to do fuss testing and even monitoring if that's your that's something you want to do. Um, and if you have code working right now, if you have a laptop up, like you can bring up your own code, uh, go over your own code, like, cause I'll be explaining how to come up with invariants. If something comes to mind and you want to write that down, please do that. Uh, I'll be working over an ex example from an audit we did a while ago. Uh, so if you don't have any code you're working on right now, or you just want to follow, follow through now and then go out and start working on variants on your own after this session, that's fine too. Uh, I'll also, it's a lot to cover, an hour isn't really enough. Uh, anyone here interested, we can just, just grab a table. I'm happy to take anyone from this crowd anywhere and just keep going with the workshop if you wanna keep working on invariants afterwards. So just, just grab me, we'll find a table somewhere and as many of you who want to keep going, we'll just keep going. I like this a bit too much. It's, <laughs> it feels almost pathological, but I love when developers come up with invariants. Um, so testing versus invariants. Testing is, I guess, I didn't see the, the previous talk, but I think he was talking about how to do better tests. Tests are sort of like the camping knife. It's like, if you know what you're doing, you can use it for almost everything and you'll get out of most things by just doing a bunch of testing. It's our first and most robust line of defense. Um, there's a myriad of resources to help you test better. There are talks here probably how to test better. Um, 
So again, I assume you already know how to do tests. I assume you do unit tests, that you do integration tests, you try deploying uh, on test nets and so on. Um, and my, my analogy for tests is it's sort of like an experiment, right? You're trying a single thing. You're going to see what happens if I do exactly this call or I do this little sequence of calls. Um, it's great. And we often like, especially test-driven developers like to talk about testing as, you know, some sort of silver bullet, or even if they say it's not, then you can kind of feel like, well, the test is, like, testing is what you need and that's going to solve your problems. Um, but I don't know any developer that actually trusts their code enough. It's like, oh, my test suite passed. Uh, bring on the billion dollars TVL. Like that, <laughs> that doesn't happen, right? You're like, you sit down and you like really think through it and you talk to your colleagues like, well, are we sure? Like, have we thought about everything? Um, and it's sort of like, that's sort of like theory. Um, reasoning about code is like developing a theory. It's like what, if, if the experiment is, or if, if testing is just an experiment, like in, in a physics or like a, a science context, they help you verify that your theory is correct. And if you do enough experience, you might be pretty convinced, but you also probably want to make sure, go over your theory and see if like, are there any holes in it? Does my theory lead to inconsistencies? Even if you tried 200 prime numbers, where maybe prime number 201 is going to be the one that breaks your little mathematical theorem. So you need to be reasoning about uh, what your theory is saying. Um, the thing is, there's very few resources about this. I had one five minute talk by my professor when I started college saying like, here's how I run over code in my head. And I think that's, that's the end of it. And it feels like reasoning about code is something you learn from experience. Uh, it's something we're always doing when we're debugging, doing code review, doing design discussions. We're kind of like simulating things in our head. Um, but there's not met much resources about it. No one's really teaching you how to do it. It's just sort of like, well, you're a good developer. With time, you'll learn it. So I want to change some of that by give you, giving you some structure. If you don't know where to start reasoning about your code to make it more secure, here's going to be a few steps to get you going. Um, this is meant to either intimidate you or titillate you, depending on what, you're, uh, what kind of person you are. Um, but we're doing something that's sort of analogous to math proofs. So in math, you were taught both like computing answers, like figuring something specific out, but also how to do proofs, how to make sure that the algorithm that I'm doing is always going to work. Again, it's sort of like the analogy testing versus uh, reasoning, experiment versus theory. Uh, reasoning about code is analogous to proofs. Before anyone say Curry Howard, like I'm not talking about something like that. If you're a theoretical computer scientist, I'm talking about something very straightforward that I think anyone who has taken a basic code boot camp should be able to do. Um, and just like proving, uh, there's a method. There's a bit of artistry. It's not always straightforward. I can't guarantee you that your proofs will work, even if your theory is correct. But th there's a structure to it. You don't have to just be flailing around trying to prove random stuff. Um, and with that, we get to the actual invariance. What is an invariant? What are we looking for? And what are we trying to do? Um, so, this is very small. Um, so, one th way to think of a good invariant, it's something that it's obvious that the code is doing or should be doing. Um, but, like, if, if it works correctly, it should be doing this specific thing, but it's sort of incidental from the code. Nowhere in the code is this, like, directly enforced. It's just something that sort of should be obvious from your business logic. Um, ideally, it's really something really high level, like a liveness, uh, like a liveness claim that, you know, you, this contract can never get stuck and so on. But to be completely honest, starting with really simple invariants will get you quite far most of the time. And we'll do a very simple invariant here today. Uh, and I can tell you from experience that even those really simple invariants that aren't like super high level claim that the entire protocol is perfectly secure, they still help you find bugs in your code and we find bugs all the time using them. Um, invariants defined as it's not varying, it's constant. In mathematics, it's unaffected by a designated operation. Uh, and, or an invariant quantity function configuration of a system. It's something that's always true. Uh, you can think of it, what's the code behind the code? Because the code is ex very exact, it's imperative, it tells the computer or like the EVM exactly how to do every little step. Uh, 
So it's, not, it's, it's imperative, not declarative, is one way to say it. And here's your chance to be declarative. You say something like, you know, here's an equation that should always hold. I think any ERC, ugh, ERC20 contract should have this property, right? You keep track of the total balance. You're minting, you're burning, uh, you're transferring. And we just kind of assume, or like we hope, or we might be very, very confident that the total balance is going to be the same as the balances in each individual account that has interacted with the mapping of balances. So this is just a way to say, take all the balances in the mapping and sum them up. If someone knows way too much about the EVM like I do, then uh, just think of it as every, every time you wrote directly into a mapping. Technically, the mapping contains a bunch of other stuff, but uh, don't worry about that. Uh, and again, a grade invariant is something that's obvious from the intended business logic, like this. Like, of course, you know, the total balance should be just all the actual balances that are out there. But it's not necessarily obvious from the code. Nowhere in the code is the stat. There's no one summing over the balance anywhere in the code. Um, here's a working example. If you, wanna, if you don't have any code of your own, you want to pull up and follow along on your uh, laptop, you can go to... Uh, GitHub, Alchemics Finance, V2 Foundry repo, it should be pinned at the top. Uh, we're working at the contract Alchemist, so we're gonna be like control Fing through a little bit of it if you wanna follow along properly. Uh, or you can just watch the slides. Uh, really quickly, this is sort of a slightly more involved version of the, the sum of all balances to the total balance invariant. They have something called shares that they're used to. Uh, that they use to make sure that you get your, you know, your the, your yield in pro in proportion to how much you have staked, uh, essentially, and then for every specific yield token, there exists a total shares valuable. So slightly more involved than the the sum of all balances is total total balance invariant. Here's how you frame it as a mathematical equation. Uh, if you go into the uh, mapping of all yield tokens where that contains the token address as a key and a set of params. That's this yield token params. And if you go to the params total shares, that should be equal to the sum over all the accounts, uh, th this value of each account. Uh, that's just one invariant we come up with. We proved uh, it turned out helpful. I'm not sure if we actually find any, found any bug on that one, but you know we do find bugs on those kinds of things quite often. Um, but the question is like, so if you're sitting here with your own code, for example, or you're watching this later, or you're thinking about your own code, how do you come up with good invariants? Uh, how do you come up with like looking for something like this? And there's a few tricks. Um, first is to come up with many, like <laughs> try to think of anything you can state as an invariant, uh, state that as an invariant, and then focus on the ones that seem to be important. Um, second one is go over storage variables. Do you have, uh, do they have like obvious relationships? This was a good example. You have the balances and you have the total balances. Of course, that should just stick out as a sore thumb. Like that's, these, the, these two things should have a very tight relationship between them. Um, ghost variables is a nice trick. That's sort of just like introducing variables that don't exist directly in the code, um, but that you can use when you're reasoning over pen and paper. I'm gonna give you an example. Um, Deoptimizing is always fun. Like you're doing a lot of optimizations, even if you're not doing even if you're not a big optimizer, you're not iterating over all the accounts uh, of all your users, for example. That's a sort of optimization. As Solidity developers, we need to optimize. But what if you just think, I don't have to optimize at all. You write the code as you would in a dumb Java program. And then you just state the invariant saying, like, well, this, this naive implementation and this optimized implementation are identical modulo gas usage. Um, go to your design spec. I hope you have one. You all write design docs, right? Um, read it over, see if there's anything you're mentioning there that's obvious, like that's something that, there's a good chance it says something in the design doc, like, well, these, these two variables should have a relationship to each other that might not have been carried over to your code comments. Uh, those are usually good invariants. Uh, you can also work from unit tests, like replace some unit test values and start thinking about what if we'd start fussing it, what if we uh, use symbolic values, what properties would they have to satisfy, and then just try to state them as you know, equations or something similar. It doesn't have to be a mathematical equation, it can also just be a very exact description. That's what happens if you open a math paper. It's, it's not all just a set of equations, it's a formal, formal line of reasoning written in English. Uh, and that's fine too. 
so ghost variables are just a way to introduce variables into your invariants or your system descriptions that don't exist on the chain or that you don't have on the chain. Um, so impossible to compute functions, we've seen already. Some, some overall balances, you can think of that as sort of a ghost variable. You can't really do it on the chain for several reasons. Uh, but you're absolutely free to use it in your, uh, in your invariants and just make sure that you know, whenever you're adding or subtracting from a balance somewhere in that mapping, then you know, that sum gets updated. Um, another one is like, well, to total deposited ever, for example, how much ether has this contract ever received? Maybe you're not actually tracking that. You can't probably actually track that in your, in your contract. But if you're just reasoning about, uh, um, about your contract, then you can say like, well, how much ether has ever been in this contract? Make that a variable and use that in your equations. Um, and hopefully you may decide that some of these ghost variables actually deserve to become state variables. It might make sense to actually keep track of these on chain. The way we do with totals, uh, even if it's just for monitoring, even if it's just a little view function, even if it costs a little bit of gas, it's gonna help you reason about your code, monitor your code, and like make sure you can run your tests on, um, on chain state forever. Uh, here's an example of deoptimizing, just to give you a quick look of what that can look like. Here's a really simple optimized, you know, normally optimized piece of code. Uh, when you give rewards, then you increment the total reward ever variable. That should be a semicolon there. Uh, and where did all semicolons go? Must have done a search replace. Oh well. Um, that's what happens when you keep copying over from different resources. Um, and then when you withdraw a reward, you just calculate, you know, whatever a user has a specific stake, and you can say the last time they reserved it they received a reward, you calculate how much reward they've earned since then, then you update some variables and you send them some tokens. The really dumb way to do this is when you say give rewards, uh, you just iterate over all the users and you give them a bit of reward. And then when they withdraw, you just set their rewards to zero and you send the tokens. You can't do that, right? That, that's not really possible. And if you do that, I will slap your fingers. But if you can definitely make a statement like, hey, these things will give the exact same uh, results for a single user, right? If we call the give rewards with a certain number of amounts, and then I call withdraw rewards, I should receive the same things from both of these implementations. That's a nice little invariant. Um, oh no, th this this would be just like you know, in a, in a do like we're gonna get to like. Part of the reasoning, yeah. I want to also emphasize, and I will emphasize a few times, you need to show your work. Again, like I feel like a math professor here, but like show your work because there's a lot, lot of work involved in coming up with the invariants and then proving them. And if you do this to yourself in your notebook and then you throw your notebook away, then you know, well, the next person is going to have to redo it or the auditor is going to have to redo it. And that can be expensive for you. So make sure that you, you know, have it. Have, I don't know how you like to document things if you like to do it in your. Uh, codes in, 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 in your code comments or if you want to have a Google Doc somewhere whichever this but but this like you could have a few pages in a Google document that say like hey what if we implement it like this here's our actual implementation these should be equivalent here's you know uh, pen and paper proof showing that it should be right. yeah so yeah, this this doesn't work in in a real contract because sorry Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't go deleting all your semicolons. Like all, all the examples here are illustrative. It's not, uh, they're not, th this one isn't pulled from an actual deployed code. Uh, it's just, you know, a quick example of what de-optimization looks like. Um, or I could say, oh, it's, it's pseudocode, like, because some of you might be writing Viper and this, the process still works, so. Um, Okay, now we get to actually proving them. So you come up with something that you say like, well, this is, should always hold over my contract forever. Uh, proving, I had a math teacher who said like, well, proving sounds scary. Like, all, it's just, you just need to convince someone. How good does your proof need to be? Well, you're gonna have to show it to someone. If that's you, if that's your friend, if that's Nature Magazine, then you know, whoever you're talking to, you need to convince them that yes, I know like my argument is sound and it's complete and you know, my, 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 uh, my theorem holds, right? Uh, the good thing about code is that it's usually boring and straightforward. It's uh, pretty mechanical um, because hopefully the code is pretty straightforward. 
Uh, and all you need to do is check a bunch of places, which can be boring, but uh, straightforward, usually. So how do you prove an invariant? Well, straightforward. You uh, figure out where are all the variables or ghost variables that are ever written to, where are they modified? You find all the locations in the code. You list every function that modify any of these invariants. Cool. You make a list, if it's a Google Doc, if it's, you know, if you have some cool Emacs tool to do that, go ahead. Uh, just make sure you have a list of them. Um, so this is like manual verification, like of course there's tools, we work with tools, we mechanize things, we love building tools to do these things, but it's actually really very useful, especially for smaller contracts that just do it as pen and paper a lot of the time. So don't get intimidated when I say like just write it down, like write it down in a doc document and follow through, it's, it doesn't actually take that long most of the time. Um, then you check what's called the base case. You check that the invariant will hold from the start in the constructor, uh, the initializer, wherever, just make sure that like your invariant isn't invalidated immediately as the contract is deployed. Uh, that's usually the easy part. And then the hardest part is the inductive case. You find all the locations that you noted here and you go over all of them. Uh, you can assume as you go into the, the contract that that's the trans transaction start that the invariant holds. Uh, and then you just look at all the locations that modify the variables, you do some symbolic updates, uh, just say like, I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second, and then you check that your invariant still holds. If you do all these and you find that the invariant holds from the beginning and it holds at the end of each function, if it held in the beginning, then you're done. Like the invariant holds forever in this contract. Um, on the working example, so if you pulled up the code, then you can control F for our variables, which are total shares and balances. Um, if we look over the contract, uh, I usually use a silver searcher and some other tools, just look, get an initial search for where are all the places where these variables can be modified. There are more structured ways to do this, but this is usually the fastest. Um, make sure you look for assembly code, because you know it can modify your storage variables. Um, and make sure you find all the relevant locations. Uh, all, also look in the contracts you inherit from, because you know modifications can happen there as well. Uh, use a dependency graph tool if you need to. In this case, we find uh, these three functions modify our total shares and balances. Add yield token, issue shares for amount, and burn shares. These two are internal, this one's external. Uh, I can just tell you the add, the first one, add yield token, uh, it's fine, it just sets the values to zero. Uh, constructor and initializer doesn't really touch any of this, so everything's zero. So we get initially zero equals zero, because the total shares for every yield token starts at zero, and all the balances start at zero, so this is a sum of zeros, and we get zero equals zero. That's true, so the invariant holds initially. And then we go and find um, the issue shares for amount. We find it in these two locations, our variables to balances and total shares get modified. Um, technically, it also makes sense to reason about like, is there, could there be re-entering seen here? Actually, in this case, that wouldn't matter. Um, are there many different paths through this function? No, it's a very straightforward function. Technically, there's a path here, but that doesn't matter for us because we always only, uh, the only relevant changes are in this basic block. Um, there's failures, but if this function fails, then, you know, state doesn't get committed and it's still fine. So we find that we add a number of shares to total shares. Read very carefully, accounts, recipient, balances, yield token, shares, yes. Yield tokens, yield token, total shares, yes, yes. Okay, we just add shares to both sides. Note that we don't really care how the shares were computed. Like we, this might be an external call, like anything can happen here, it doesn't matter. We, what we know is that if we come to this location in the code and we go through this line and this line, our invariant will hold once we're out of it. Uh, this one is left as an exercise to the reader. It's slightly more not challenging. It's just the exact same thing. Um, but I mean, like now we've proven this invariant and it may son sound slightly meaningless, but it's sort of like that, that was one of those questions that come up as you're developing. Hey, am I sure that, well, total shares and like the, uh, and the balances, they should always match. Uh, I should check that at some point. Uh, maybe I haven't, but like, 
now you have checked it and you wrote down your proof hopefully and now you know and you don't have to worry about it. That's one good thing. Um, you can convince everyone that the invariance holds. Uh, the case may seem trivial, but as things get hairier, the bugs get scarier. And this class of bugs are definitely out there. People do forget to like do the second variable update. I mean, you, it wouldn't be crazy to find this code without uh, the second line here. It happens. It, you know, someone slips through a code review and then it happens and now you're in deep shit. Uh, because this is actually used to calculate rewards and if, if this line was missing, you'd be in deep trouble and your auditors would find it and report it a critical vulnerability. Uh, and again, make sure you save yourself some, somewhere useful, somewhere you can find it, somewhere you can show your colleagues uh, so you don't have to redo your work. Um, Chris, is anyone, did anyone pull up some of their own code and is looking for invariance in that? Oh, someone, okay, cool. Okay, so I know that you're all hardcore super developers and your code is not always this straightforward. Um, so what do you do then? Uh, failed proofs, and I don't mean, like, if you find that the proof doesn't hold, then you know your variant is invalidated and you need to like make sure that, you know, figure out why, why it doesn't work and fix that. What I talk about here is failed proofs is when you actually fail to prove it. You didn't really conclude that your invariant doesn't hold. Uh, you're not sure it holds. What can you do? Especially as code gets, gets hairier. Uh, well, so these, when that happens, it's actually a good guide to refactoring and refining your code. Uh, so here's some basic tools that we can use and we usually recommend, like if we can't prove, if we can't prove an invariant and we really try to, uh, then we usually ask you like, hey, can you make this a bit more clear? Because we haven't been able to convince ourselves. We haven't been able to convince you. Uh, you should want to be convinced of this invariant. And until that happens, we should make sure that we can either help each other reason through the code or we can make the code more easy to reason about. Uh, so if the function's if logic is too complex, if you really don't want to refactor, one thing you can do is you can, instead of giving a name to each function, you give a name to each basic block. As, does everyone know what I mean when I say basic block? Okay, going back. Um, so a basic block of code is a code that will always be executed together. So for example, if you enter this, if you enter this function, um, this can't fail, there's no branching here. This can't fail, there's no, well, this can fail actually, so. Um, but if we, okay, if we ignore reverting failures, for this case, which we can, because you know, reverts will just mean that nothing happened. Um, these three lines will always be executed together. Uh, and so will this condition, but this line may or may not be executed. So you can think of this as a basic block and this is a basic block. If you have a while loop, then the body is a good example of a basic block if there's no more branching in it. Basically anything that's like, you can treat as a solid chunk of code that will always be executed together with each other. If you had thrown this line into here, or like another if case, then it would not be in the same basic block, and then it would be harder to reason that your invariant holds. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th that's what a basic block is. It's a single piece of code that will always be executed together. Um, and if you have really complex logic and your functions are really big, you might want to, instead of giving labels to just the functions, you give labels to each basic block. Uh, and the reasoning works the same way. If you can prove that after each basic block, as you go into it and as you come out of it, the invariant holds, then you know your inductive proof is fine and your invariant holds. Uh, what we find sometimes is that you will only, like the variables that need to be updated together are updated in slightly different places. Uh, and then we get an argument like, well, you know, but they will always, because of like some sort of reasoning about the possible execution conditions, they will still always be executed together. Well, why don't, just co-locate them, put them right after one another to make it easy to reason about them. Um, if you have complex arithmetic expressions with rounding, ignore that for now. Uh, treat numbers as real numbers. Don't worry about rounding at all. You can do rounding error analysis separately. Write your stuff as functions. Imagine it's all real numbers. Make sure your invariant holds, and then you do rounding error analysis. We did a talk on that yesterday. I'm sure you can find the link in the DevCon videos. Um, about how to do rounding error analysis to make sure your contracts are safe. 
Um, if you have a bunch of different invariants, a nice thing is to do what's called framing conditions. You just write over each function which st storage it modifies. So you can look at a function and say, like, well, this function modifies all these storage variables. Um, if it doesn't modify any one of the ones you care about, then you're fine. If it modifies one of the ones in your invariant, but not one of the others, then, you know, look out. Uh, but it's just a good way to build up your code with comments that will make it easier to reason about in a structured way if you're doing this more and more. Um, again, did you check everything? <laughs> Imports, inheritance, both up and down, uh, inline assembly. There's a bunch of places where you can have uh, storage modifications that you weren't thinking about. Uh, control Fing does is not enough. Uh, and if the code keeps changing, if you're doing this as you're prototyping, you're doing it wrong. This is like once you've done a proof and you checked everything and your code changes, you will need to recheck your proof. So this is very much something you will do towards the end, ideally when the code is frozen or almost frozen. Um, so again, like if you're asking a, an audit firm to audit your code, you should ideally freeze it before, and that will, like, whenever you freeze it, you can start doing this, or slightly before. Do you have a question? Yeah. Right, hang on. For the live stream. So pretty much when I have the client that really likes to change the uh, assumptions of the whole project, basically, then uh, I should, I guess, I should uh, write those invariants, but recheck them every time uh, the changes happens, yes? Yeah, and I mean, that can be a, a statement of work. Hey, we did all these things, and then, oh, we just wanted to add a new functionality, and like, okay, I'm gonna recheck these things, that's gonna take me four days, and like, but you already checked them, like, well, you changed the code. It's like, that's sort of the negotiation with, um, with the client, and it also kind of emphasizes that you do need to freeze your code as much as possible. Like, so, again, if you, if, you doc, if you document your proofs really well and they don't refactor everything and change the entire design, then change, like looking over the proofs should be pretty straightforward. If you're used to it, you can kind of work from the diff. Uh, just, oh, they made this code diff and you can make sure that all these changes would still respect the invariant. Um, just look at all those locations and make sure that the invariant is still respected. Do you have the microphone? Thanks, Yao. Yeah, I just wanted to add that maybe the thing he's talking about with frame conditions helps with that because you write down, you know, what storage slots each function is modifying. Tell your client, like, hey, you make the modification, write down the updated storage slots, and then that minimizes how many functions you have to recheck your invariant for. Because if they didn't change which storage slots it was asking, you don't have to recheck it. And I mean, there's, and there's a feedback loop here as well, right? I mean, if you, if you write down the framing conditions, put them in the function, and then you can make sure that the client knows to respect them or like, you know, up, up, again, update their framing conditions. And so w one beautiful thing about this way of working that we found is a lot of our clients get trained to do this more and more themselves. They start producing better code. It's more readable. It's, uh, it's not always less complex, but like the important things are more co-located and so on. So uh, I would say if you personally, if, if clients keep changing the code, like make sure that they understand that there's a cost to that. Uh, if they still want to do it, of course they can do it. Um, but also help them to tr train them to be better at when they do that. They also make sure that the proofs that you produced or that they produced that they have are also kept up to date, right? Um, yeah, I like things. It's like co-location, sort of like imagine like if you. I don't know if anyone writes Java or C or JavaScript. Imagine if you use one of the basic data structures like hash tables or something and you manually had to manage the, the number of items, you man had to manage all the internal variables. This is sort of a kind of encapsulation. Uh, I know people don't always love using libraries for different reasons, uh, you know, gas off my shizzes and so on, but try to make sure that your, uh, your, your code behaves more like it, like, you know, the, all the things that are relevant to this little data structure are updated in the same place. How do you recommend testing uh, basic blocks if they're like within a function? Like unit testing them? Uh, like for invariance, if you want a, a certain variance oh, for a basic block? I mean, it's just the same thing, right? Uh, like, in, like if you, let's say that this was a really complex function and there's a bunch of code here and a bunch of code here, uh, with, and there's a bunch of different paths through this function, right? I would name this basic block, whatever basic block these contain, 
I would name that something. And then instead of checking every function, instead of going over, over every function and proving this, I would just prove it over the basic block, like here. So I know I can assume as we, as we go into this block, when we are here, assume the invariant holds. After the basic block, which I know will be executed together, I can show that it holds. And then for every basic block, you just go, well, in this basic block, it's not modified. So if it holds before, then it holds after. This, the basic blocks up here, if it gets modified before, uh, if it's, it doesn't get modified, so it still holds, right? So it's sort of like, you, 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 instead of show, showing that the invariants hold over each function, you do it over the basic block, and you give them a name or something. Uh, and if for some reason this was down here, one of the updates were down here, then that's a good reason to move it up so that they're in the same place. Because that will make you reason. It, it's a lot harder to reason about it if they're in the different basic blocks. Because then you have to think about everything that happens between there. But if you co-locate them, then it's a lot easier. OK, I do want to. Well, you, you need, I mean, technically, you could say like you need it to hold from, if it holds in the beginning of the transaction, it holds at the end of the transaction. but. Like, I mean, maybe the sorry, maybe the invariant uh, breaks uh, between two blocks, but the, your invariant holds for the whole function. Yeah. How how do you recommend dealing with that? It's just much hairier proof to make. Like it's it's just like if you really need to do like consider if you really need to do that. If you really need to do it that way, then you do need to treat the entire thing as one block and reason about all the possible paths between. Uh, I'm a little short on time uh, if I want to get through this. So we do have minute. 10 minutes of questions at the end, right? Uh, so if there's something that... Just one quick question. If you, if you have like... Uh, hello. Uh, if you have like an ID, for instance, um, that you generate and you increase one by one, um, this ID will eventually overflow and you, can, you cannot prove that it will never overflow. But it will require millions of transactions. So in practice, the, you, you should not, you, you can prove it, but it will be never reachable. Uh, so what is, what is your view on this? You state your assumptions. You make the assumption that there will never be two to the power 256 uh, transactions on the Ethereum blockchain, and you move on with your day. That's it. All right. It's like the, the, the counter in open settling contracts can be unchecked on its increment because it will never update. It will never overflow, if you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, then it doesn't matter. Um, so uh, I, I just need to move on. Uh, so if, it's, if, you're, if you're having a lot of trouble, look at the invariant that's giving you trouble, pick one function, uh, look at all the relevant variables, and try to group them. Uh, you may have to create a few different paths. Uh, use helper functions. Like, you know, th this one's really good. The, they have the burn shares and issue shares. I think that might have been in our recommendation. Like, well, these things will be, have to be updated together. Let's make sure they're updated in a single place. Uh, where all the relevant things to burning shares happen together, right? Don't do it all in, you know, all over the code, if you can avoid it. Um, remember, th this is what you need to show. The invariant holds at construction time, initialization, and if the invariant holds at the beginning of a basic block, it holds at the end of the basic block. If you prove that for all the blocks, then the invariant holds. Anyone who likes discrete math, this is an induction proof. Um, we're security auditors. We have slightly different priorities sometimes from developers. So, like, we kind of security is the most important thing. Simplicity is the second most important thing. It can, it can depend, but like, the thing is, simplicity is so tied into security that we really care about simplicity, and we'd rather have you skip a neat bit of, bit of functionality if it just makes things too complex, and then you know, save that for version two or something or an extension. And optimizations are. The least important thing, I know that doesn't resonate with everyone, but uh, if these things are so much more important to you than uh, keeping things simple and having it make it being easy to reason about security, what you can do, again, it's just, it's a lot of work, but then again, uh, you should probably spend, you know, 10 times more time on securing your smart contract code than you spend on writing it, uh, so it might be worth it. You can start with simple functions and Prove that they're, it's sort of like the de-optimization thing. Start with something simple, prove that it's correct, 
then start doing incremental optimizations and prove at every step that your proof still holds, right? And you end up with a slightly more complex proof, but you'll end up with a proof nonetheless saying that your invariant still holds over your more optimized, um, optimized code. Um, I do want to talk about invariants as test targets. Uh, we like to use Foundry. Uh, you can take your invariants and just create a bunch of tests to just test those as properties. Like you, uh, you take the invariant we had here and you, there you go, uh, and you run a test uh, that just does a bunch of different operations and it interacts with your protocol in a bunch of different ways. And at the end, it checks your property. That's pretty straightforward. A really cool thing you can do uh, is if you could instrument your testing to just, you know, at the end of every test you're running, check your invariant. Like, make sure your invariant just always holds everywhere. Uh, it can be hairier. There's some things. <laughs> I'm going to show you uh, one trick to do it. It's not, it's not the most elegant way, but it's the mo most simplest that will get you going quickly. Um, here's a dead simple idea. We take the contract we just had uh, and we just wrap it. So we take all the functions that affect user accounts so we make sure we keep track of all the users we have so we can do the sum over all the balances thing uh, and then we just whenever there's an interaction we make sure we add that user to the set then we do the regular uh, update and we then at the end of every function we check our invariance um, and we do this for all the contract or all the relevant functions in the contract and checking the invariance is just checking well you know the ones we have this one's called a2 uh, so Checking A2 is just doing this thing. We're summing over all the balances, and then we make sure that matches the total shares. So now you're checking your invariant at the end, like in each and every uh, interaction you're doing with your contract. Uh, again, I mean, I'm sure a bunch of you are cool hackers, and you could do this with, uh, I forget the name of the foundry op code, but you know, you can update the, the EVM code of the contract in place to do this in a cooler way and in a more robust way. but this will get you going pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, the, the basically, your job is to op update ghost variables. The variables that you have in storage, you can always check. Your ghost variables, you need to keep track of with a wrapper. Uh, this might also convince you that some of your ghost variables should be actual variables. Maybe, it's, maybe it makes sense to keep track of a set of all your users in your code. I don't know. Uh, it's a trade-off you have to make. Uh, and finally, I just want to mention, you can also use this for monitoring. I think someone mentioned it. Um, there's two approaches to monitoring. Um, roughly, one of them is just doing it on chain. Like, make like check your if you find some important invariants that you can check on chain. You can put them in requires and assert clause, and then if something, if for some reason at the end of a transaction they are violated, you bail. You stop the protocol. Um, that's good because you can halt the contract before bad things happen. You can't. No one's going to be able to m mess with your. Uh, toll shares and like steal a bunch of yield that way. Uh, it is pretty scary though, because it can, can cause liveness bugs. You don't want your contract to end up in a state where it can never proceed and now all the funds are stuck. Uh, so, you know, talk to your auditor. It's like talking to your doctor, like, you know, we're, we're, we're here, have them on speed dial, ask like, I'm not sure about this, but I have this little thing in my code. And like, they might say that's fine or they might say, come right in, drop everything you're doing and let's talk about this. Uh, and you know, obviously gas costs, you have to, Put the gas cost on all the users, or you can do off-chain monitoring. A poor man's monitor. Uh, we'll get to that, but uh, you can, you know, deploy it later. Even if you already have a protocol up and running, you can still deploy um, some off-chain monitoring. Uh, it can cause liveness bugs, obviously. Uh, what do you do if you detect a failure? Maybe it's already too late. Your invariant got violated. Someone stole all your money, um, and it may not prevent hacks that, you know, happen in a single block. Someone uses flashbots and violates some invariants and now, you know, the damage is already done before your sentinels can come in and halt your protocol. Uh, a poor man's monitor is actually just using your foundry fussing test and running them constantly against on-chain state. And, you know, pinging a dev if for some reason they get violated. Um, after that, well, well, First, I should mention, what can you do next? Well, you can keep finding invariants. Uh, you can add more, uh, document them, share them with your auditors, share them with your, uh, with your users. You probably have a bunch of white hat users, hopefully, that can. If you make bold statements, they will take that as a challenge to go out and try to find violations of them. Um, and you, the good thing is you can kind of keep doing this long after deployment, finding 
uh, finding good invariants, making that will improve your documentation, uh, and that will improve your monitoring. So you know, security doesn't end when you deploy. Uh, another thing I want to mention is we like so some bulk execution. We like formal verification. Uh, so we're working pretty hard on making sure that if you write your invariants in Foundry and you fuss over them, you can try as many million inputs as you want. Uh, we also have a tool that will let you uh, run it symbolically. So try it on all inputs. Uh, there's a bunch of trade-offs. You should do fussing first because it's fast. Uh, you can write your test using Solidity. Same thing because you know we used to Foundry test anyway. Um, you're limited to what you can express in Solidity, whereas with our KVM Foundry implementation, you can kind of use all of matching logic. Uh, not all of matching logic, but a lot of matching logic. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice logic. Uh, fussing is extremely fast. Uh, this symbolic execution is pretty slow. It's getting faster. My CTO is looking at me. <laughs> uh, I might have called it this orange, but it's turning more and more yellow. Um, doesn't require any human intervention. Uh, this often requires human intervention uh, because a symbolic execution or uh, engine or a prover might not be able to complete. It might not be able to say, yes, I proved it, or no, I found a counterexample. It might say, ah, C3 can't handle this query, so you're going to have to help me out here. And that can require some uh, expert human intervention. Symbolic inputs are 100% input, input coverage. You're testing every possible value. Uh, so if you pr prove your invariance with uh, KVM and Foundry, then you've, they're proven. Uh, this was contentions yesterday, the, the idea of false positives and false negatives. I think it's unfair to say that you have false negatives with fussing because, well, it's not like Foundry comes in or Echidna comes and says like, oh, actually, we didn't find anything, so therefore it's safe. But the problem is sometimes that's what developers or users think. So uh, that's why you can think of that as a false positive. You can't really have a, or a false negative. You can't really have a false negative or a false positive with symbolic execution. Either we prove that this doesn't hold, or we prove that it holds. Either your invariance is correct, or it's not. Uh, or you get stuck and you need a human. And then you need to do some things that are easy to try, hard to master. Uh, easy to try means that you can get in on our alpha release and do it. Uh, hard to master means you might have to call us and we'll help you. And we're happy to help you along. Um, here's what it can look like. You know, Forge test will run the standard 256 tests for you. You can make, turn this up to as many million as you want. Uh, with KVM Foundry, uh, this is a example from Roll's talk yesterday. Uh, KVM was able to prove that a specific invariant just held uh, that was written initially as a Foundry test. Uh, again, go and look at his video if you want to check that out. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we are starting a research branch at runtime verification. So if anyone's research minded, or just curious, please go to research.runtimeverification.com. We have a bunch of re research challenges there. If any one of them look interesting, just reach out to us. We'll see uh, how we can help you along, or if we happen to hear your ideas on any of the research challenges. I think that's what I got. Uh, we do have 10 minutes for questions, I was promised. So I've seen a few hands. Uh, again, if someone wants to like, try this right now, like. Pull up some of your code, try to find some few, a few invariants. I'll just do a little train out of here and we'll find a table somewhere and sit down and work for as long as we have to. Uh, if you go home and you do this later, write me at Twitter or at runtimeverification.com. You can always reach out to us at Discord. We're happy to help. Uh, this is a past talk. The video should come soon. So check that out as well. It's important to what. Uh, what you'll be doing, because eventually your invariant will contain a division, and then all bets are off, uh, and you need to know what you're doing. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the idea that you can uh, do pen and paper proofs as a really you know robust method is new to me. I guess my question is, it might be a bit vague, but like, how do you think of the risk of, let's say, I take that seriously, and I write my proof, I convince my team member. How do you think about the risk that we've still missed something? Is it common in your experience if like a client takes it seriously that they, they kind of mess that process up? Um, the good thing is that if they do, then I mean, we'll, if, if, if you write invariants and like, hey, we have a proof, we will also check the proof. Like, I mean, we're- It's part of the audit. Yeah, we're the ACM journal you're submitting to. We'll, we'll, like, you know, we'll make sure that your reasoning is sound uh, because like, oh, this is a good invariant. 
we trust you guys, but let's double check, right? Um, ask for pen and paper versus, so this is still formal verification. Someone says like, someone said like, oh, it's not formal verification because it's pen and paper. No, it is formal verification. It's not mechanized formal verification. You wouldn't take a math paper and say, oh, it's not a formal proof because it's in English. It's like, it's still formal proof. It's about how you reason and how good you are at formal reasoning. Um, it's about how many nines you need, right? I mean, it's a Swiss cheese model. Um, you can't, you may not ever catch everything that you want to catch. The world is chaotic, but if you start with your pen and paper proofs, that will get you a very long way. And in the end, like a few of these things might be like, like the invariant I showed you, I wouldn't even necessarily want to mechanize that because like, ah, there's more interesting things to mechanize, but here's a pen and paper proof that's fairly convincing and we'll make a little note somewhere that if anything happens that updates any of these variables, we need to double check it, right? It's sort of like a, an index for you to work with. Um. I, I sort oh, of grab yeah, the mic. Yeah, so. whoever, ha whoever has the mic, just go. Uh, okay, so um, obviously, like part of the limitations of, of defining invariants would be like if it if it's a house and the invariant is no thief can go through the front door or come out if he somehow got in, right? Let's say that's the invariant, right? So obviously, the limitation would be that um, you know we sort of like didn't define that. Oh, there's also a window, you know, or, or there you know there were roof tiles or there was something to that effect. Um, now, obviously, you didn't make the statement that. That, that it's like an absolute thing, but how do we work towards like um, that kind of like uh, comprehensive or exhaustive type of um, invariant definition? Well, I, so I mean, to, to work with your analogy, what you do is something like, instead of saying the thief can't go through the front door, it's like, what you care about? The thief can't get in the house. And then you have to say, what are all the ways to get in the house? Like, you know, is, is there a hole, like what can happen? Is there a hole in the wall somewhere? Is there a window? Can you get in from the roof? Uh, it's sort of the same thing here. It's like one thing we do a lot is like a really good to start an audit with is where are all the places where any token transfers happen? Those are a great place to work backwards from because you know, and then there's always inline assembly, but let's, let's forget that for now. Um, but just look at all the places where tokens or ether changes hands. And then look, then you can start looking like, well, if we cover all the paths that can reach those locations and those are all safe, then we're safe. And then, you know, of course, like, you know, what, what if the token can do weird things, if it like can block users or something, something you need to keep in mind. But um, yeah, that, that, that's sort of the approach, right? Like find like, well, take the floor of the house as the thing that this thief can never reach and then like exhaustively enumerate all the ways someone can reach the floor of your house, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So I mean, like a lot of these things, like well, you know, the dev the devs can upgrade the contract and take all your money. Like that's that's an assumption. Sorry, like, but barring that, we're doing reasoning. Who has Mike? I have Mike. Um, so in the example you showed, where you talked about basic blocks, m my reaction was like, and and, and reasoning about invariants before and after, they're not. As it's written, they're not necessarily accessible to us to, to like, it's not, maybe we instrument it, but yeah, they're, they're, I can't really get in there easily with the tools I have in my hand, at, by hand, like Forge, and say, okay, this is an invariant that holds over this if statement, or like the block in there. Um, so, so I'm curious, like, you know, how, if there is a way I'm missing, and then this, this also maybe part two is like, does verifiable code look different than uh, like readable code and testable code? Because if I'm to, I imagine pulling this out into a lot of helper functions, and that's not my preference in this case. So uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Um, well, so first of all, I mean like in the Foundry comes with some limitations that you don't have like, you know, in a very, very, very mature language like Java, there's all kinds of reflections and like Python, like there's just nothing you can't do. Whereas, you know, you, we, this function is internal, so we can't, can't you really unit test with Foundry. Um, so, which is also a good reason to do this kind of reasoning, because like instead of having to go through all your code uh, with a tool, you can just go and say like, well, I know Solidity well enough to say that, well, the only way this storage lock can be modified is either in inline assembly or somewhere where this is exactly named in this way, uh, in this specific contract. I don't think anyone's made a Solidity. No, there's no, yeah. There's no other way to round it right now. So, um, 
So I mean, th that, that's why this reasoning is pretty good. Like you can actually, especially right now with the state of Solidity, you can track tackle these things on pen and paper quite easily that you can't really do with Foundry. Um, as for the readable, or I, I'd say that I say they all come together pretty well uh, in the sense that you don't have to have small helper functions all over, but like. Like, I, I, again, the, the data structure example, right? Like, if you think of your Java hash map as a single entity, make sure that, like, it might be a good idea to have, like, you know, the updates or deletions from from that just be co-located, and it might as well probably be a function, right? Uh, so, I, and it's not about going crazy. I wouldn't say, like, break these out two in, in a helper function. Like, we have burns and we have the issues. Like, that's fine. It's only two places. Um, verifiable code. <laughs> And testable, well, testable code, especially now if you're using Foundry, uh, testable code kind of requires you to put everything public, which, you know, is a bunch of costs that you might not want to pay. Um, but verifiable code, I'd say, now it just really relies on this, that you have all the relevant changes to things that have a, a clear relationship are co-located, uh, whether that's in functions or anywhere else. And, you know, write a, write, write a bunch of... Um, inline comments that say like you know how you're respecting this environment and so on uh, i'd say that the the enemy of this is maintainable code that's why it's like the good thing here is like well things we don't maintain that much code here like we deploy it and then it's deployed um so you don't have to worry that much about like well what if we change the code and then we forget to update the, the code comments because like we're kind of relying on the idea that things get frozen here that's one reason that formal methods doesn't haven't really had a break breakthrough in you know web 2 or standard backend development because like well everything has to be maintainable if you keep if you have to redo your proofs all the time then you know it might not be worth it so the fact the code is frozen is actually pretty important here does that answer it okay i actually have a follow on question to that uh, I, right here in the back hi yeah um, you you said that you should be doing these proofs only during the uh, or when the code is frozen because you can't you don't want to have to be redoing your changes over and over and Right. Which is right. Like you don't want to have to be redoing this work, but if you have something to mechanize the invariant checking, you can do it. You know, not only with changes, but you can also get valuable feedback during the development cycle, right? So, and that has other benefits too that you sort of alluded to in your symbolic execution is that you don't have to rely on the fact that you have to manually up look at all the places where uh, storage is updated. You don't have to worry about the fact that you made a delegate call into a library and oops, actually that library had an inline assembly block that's secretly uh, changing that. That all gets sort of uh, handled for you automatically during mechanized uh, proving. So, um, I, I, I just, I, I guess, I quibble with what you have said there that you should only be doing your invariant proofs. You should probably be doing it uh, much more frequently. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, I'm, I'm, I'm more talking from experience. Like, it's, it's. I, I would say, like, start writing invariants like, as soon as you hit your docs. Like, you know, you're doing your design. Start writing invariants. Keep them up to date in the code. Realistically, that doesn't happen as much as I'd like. If you want to be a unicorn and do that, I love you. But like. I, I know most people here won't do it. Um, that, that's sort of what I was, I was getting at. And especially like, yeah, if, if you do your instrumented, instrumented tests, then, you know, go right ahead. It's also like from experience, sometimes designs change enough during the process that maybe teams don't want to invest all that time in. Because these instrumented tests can take a while to do as well. If you want to have some examples, go to that Alchemix uh, V2 Foundry repo. It's called that because we're working on uh, setting up Foundry tests sort of like this, but like, even even uh, more powerful and extensive uh, so you can see some of the work that goes into doing like full foundry uh, checking of a bunch of different invariants but the, the all the invariants came from an audit where we found them and uh, wrote like formal English proofs of them Lucas over there actually did did that so it, it's uh, yes this paper and a, a bunch of other things in our publications are actually really good resources if you just want more examples of this. Uh, there's an entire section where we just go over like 10 different invariants and give formal, fairly formal proofs or hand waves uh, about why each of them holds. So it's a great place to go and see more examples. Uh, there's also links if you go again to the beginning in the, the lecture notes are slightly more extensive. There should be links in there. Uh, a, a kind of a follow-up on that. It strikes me that some of this could be related to behavior-driven development. 
uh, I don't know if I haven't really seen this in the Solidity Web3 world, but you know, think of like a TDD loop, but then zoom out. So instead of writing a failing unit test red green refactor loop, you're doing a red green refactor loop at like uh, app or protocol functionality level. So instead of like the standard arrange, act, assert way that we might set up a unit test in behavior driven development, uh, they call it given when then. So given some background, when some action gets taken, then I expect these assertions at the end. And I think it could fit well with like trust, uh, threat modeling, like actors, assets, actions. I was just curious if you've seen that because when we're doing BDD and I'm trying it out on a Solidity project, you got to keep those green. And so I wonder if there's a way to kind of drive some of your development with invariants that you use in the BDD world, you use Cucumber, which is like um, runnable, English language, so I, I, I thought that might be a pattern. I didn't know if you've seen that. Uh, no, I before. haven't, but I, I want to talk to you. That's, right that on, sounds cool. great. I want to check that out. Cool. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to make one clarification that the inductive proof at the function level is what you need to perform to get the invariant to hold, but the basic block level is easier. That's why it's presented as an alternative. So if you can show it at the basic block level, then it holds at the function level, not necessarily the other way around. So if you can't show it at the basic block level, try it at the function level, it still might hold. So. Does it, does it work with Viper, the KVM? I guess it's uh, language agnostic, right? Okay. So, yeah. so KVM doesn't actually work over Viper. Uh, so the thing is like, well, the, the thing we're developing now works over Foundry, and Foundry works over Solidity. Uh, but I mean, there's nothing stopping you from setting up your own little pipeline where you build your contracts in Viper, test them in Solidity with Foundry, or just, you know, hack on Foundry to make it include a Viper compiler and then do the same things. Because, you know, it, it's all EVM at the bottom anyway, so. Uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure someone's going to hack together a Viper extension of Foundry eventually. But, uh, yeah. Just curious if you had any examples of mechanized invariant tests that you like to look to or that I could look over just I still haven't wrapped my mental like my head around the, the mental framework for parsing out like what invariants should look like uh, yeah maybe like a mix of English uh, like pen and paper invariants and code might be might be helpful yeah I'd say ch check out the the alchemix paper for a good like run through of um, so there's a section in the beginning that lists invariants and there's a section in the end that proves the invariants uh, and in between are just all like the you know um, findings reports um, with mechanized proofs I don't we, we, I mean we have a bunch of like tests it come talk to us like depends on like your background and where you want to start we have just a bunch of different resources depending on what you're interested in your starting level there's the make make or die uh, multi-collateral die proofs if you want like well here's a full uh, formal treatment uh, which has some English language stuff but it's also like you know fully formally uh, specified at the function level all of it and that's all verified um, that's a good example but you know hang around we'll, we'll clear you out oh yeah yeah anyone in a oh shit uh, anyone in a runtime verification t-shirt is, is, is there no walk workshop after this oh, okay, okay okay cool so yeah we, we can't hang around here now okay fair enough okay thanks everyone <laughs>